um, by just saying thank you to Tom um, for your thoughts this morning during our communion meditation. So I, I believe our time around, while I honor the time that we have uh, to open up the Word of God and to, to listen to the Word that God has to speak to us through His Word uh, during this time, I believe that the pinnacle moment of our time together on Sundays happens around this table uh, as we are united through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ and as we're, as we're brought together around this one common interest and that is um, the love that Christ has for us. And so uh, I see this as being the pinnacle moment uh, of our time, of our worship. And so, uh, Tom, I, I want to say thank you to you. So every Sunday, and today was no different, uh, I wake up and I get here early uh, and I spend some time praying that God, uh, through his spirit, will speak to us. Uh, and this morning, I feel that uh, very confident that the Lord spoke to us through you, Tom, at, around the table. And so I thank you for your humility and your honesty and your vulnerability um, and, and just want to point out uh, that to you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and whether or not I understand that sometimes, as Tom reminds us, uh, as leaders, as spiritual leaders, we find ourselves in a season uh, where we just don't feel like that. We don't feel like a spiritual leader. Uh, but this morning, you, you let us well, brother. And so I appreciate that. We're going to continue our time today uh, talking a little bit about spiritual leadership. To be completely honest with you, I wasn't sure if I would be here today. Um, so Natalie is still, uh, we are still without uh, the baby. We're just waiting and waiting. And so I can't promise I'll be here next week. David is ready. I sent him a text this morning just to kid with him and said, you're up, buddy. We're on our way to the hospital. Um, and he didn't respond. And then I got panicked. So I, I told him, I'm just kidding. Um, but David is, is going to do an awesome job. He's been planning some great stuff. Uh, to fill in once the baby has been uh, born for a few weeks. Uh, but we're here this morning, and so we're going to continue on with our study talking about what it looks like to be a spiritual leader in the home, in our church, and in our community. And today we're going to talk about sort of expanding that question, but I'll explain that in just a moment. seems like every year we hear of some story where there is some massive corporation that goes through some sort of transition or turnover in their leadership. A CEO who's retiring or a CEO who's moving on to another company. And there's a question that plagues board members when this happens of these large corporations. And that is this, what do we do next? What do we do next? One of the largest corporations in our country, Disney, right now at this very moment, is going through this terrifying question of what next after a strong leader is stepping aside. So their CEO, since I think about 2005, Bob Iger uh, announced last year that he would be retiring and, and stepping away in 2018. And Disney had a succession plan for how they would replace this CEO of this massive corporation that just sort of unraveled right before them last year. And so it forced their CEO to agree to work for one more year while they scramble to find somebody to take his place, while they scramble to find somebody strong enough and qualified enough to lead this massive, this global corporation of Disney. This is something that corporations deal with on a yearly basis. What do we do next when our strong leader, when our good leader has moved on? Because of the reality that one day strong leaders and good leaders, leaders will need to be replaced, there's an insane amount of money that's spent in corporations every single year. In the U.S. alone, every single year, there is over $14 billion spent by companies on what they consider lead to be leadership development. Because they understand that one day they'll be in a position where someone will need to rise up, some man or some woman will need to rise up from the ranks to avoid a costly lapse in leadership. When over 500 CEOs, top executives, were polled and asked this question, what is your number one priority and concern? Over two-thirds of them responded with this, leadership development. Are we preparing leaders to take over when we move aside? The corporate world, world is forced to realize something due to the large money that's at stake that sometimes we as a church fail to recognize or sometimes ignore, and that is this question right here. The ultimate test of leadership is what happens when a leader is gone. The ultimate test of leadership is what happens when that leader is no longer there. The ultimate test of an organization is what happens 
when the organizer is no longer around. And I would argue that Christ's church has quite a bit more at stake than Disney or Google or Amazon or any other cor- corporation. If we fail to produce and train spiritual leaders, what will happen to the church and the mission of God when the next generation rises up and we pass away? If we fail to produce and train and develop spiritual leaders, what will come of the kingdom work of God? Last week we talked about um, Moses' transition of leadership, his transition of power uh, onto Joshua after, towards the end of his life. And this is a significant moment in the history of Israel because at this time they've really only had one leader. So there's been sort of these figures like Abraham, but as far as one designated, designated leader from God to say, this is the man that you're going to follow, there's only been one, and it's been Moses. And Moses has done this fairly well and fairly faithfully with a couple of little areas where things got a little muddy. But for the most part, Moses has been the ideal leader for Israel, and now there's this moment of transition where they're standing on the mountain, and we talked about it last week, where they're looking out into the land that God has promised. And Moses realizes two things. Number one, he's not supposed to go. He's not allowed to lead God's people into the promised land. And number two, his time here on earth is drawing pretty short. It's coming to an end. And so there's this recognition that Moses has, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, that someone new has to step in. The leader is about to be gone. And what is going to happen to these people? What is going to happen to these people when I am no longer here? And so, there's a passage that I want to read to you this morning that is just absolutely startling. That details what happens after this transition has been given over to Joshua. So Joshua, as we talked about last week, takes over power. And for the most part, Joshua is a really great leader in Israel's history. And he does a fantastic job of leading God's people into the promised land. And he does a fantastic job of leading God's people into battle and being victorious in that. But for all of the great things that Joshua does in his leadership, there's one stark negative on the resume of Joshua when it comes to how he led Israel. And it's this. He failed to produce someone who would lead the next generation. He failed to establish quality. He failed to develop quality leaders in Israel. So the book of Judges picks up after Joshua's time of leadership with Israel is over. We're going to be in Judges chapter 2 just for a brief moment. But the book of Judges sort of serves as a, a, an account of a less than ideal time in Israel's history. It's a time after the transition of Joshua, and now Joshua has died and he's moved on. And as the scripture will say, he's been gathered up with his ancestors. And now the people are left, like Disney and like some of these corporations, asking this question well, what next? And the book of Judges is that account of how Israel deals with this. And they don't really deal with it well. But I want to read this to you. This is going to be Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Pay attention to the words here. It begins by talking a little bit about the leadership of Joshua. It says, After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take the possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and, and, who had, and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Essentially, this is some pretty good marks for Joshua, right? It says that during the time of Joshua, while Joshua was serving, while Joshua was leading, and the people who Joshua led all around him, while they were still alive, while they were still here, while they were still with Israel, Israel was in pretty good shape. They served the Lord. They honored the Lord. So, so far, so good. But if you skip down, the next couple verses just talks about the death of Joshua. Verse 8, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timath, Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, and north of Mount Gash. Then verse 10, pay attention closely to the words. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors... Another generation grew up who, neither, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. What a chilling statement. After Joshua has left this earth, and after the elders, the people who had served with Joshua, the people who led alongside Joshua, the people who followed Joshua, after all of them are gone, what happens to Israel is this. A whole generation of people 
grow up who don't know the rich stories of what God has done for their own people and delivering them from Israel and providing for them in the desert. A whole generation of people have grown up not knowing about the covenant promises that God has given to them and the relationship, the special elected relationship that their people have with the Lord. There was no one there to lead them into the next generation. Leaders don't just create followers. They create more leaders. Joshua, for all the great things he does, fails to set Israel up into the next generation. So this morning our question extends beyond this question that we've been asking ourselves. Am I a spiritual leader in my home? in my family? Am I a spiritual leader in my church, in the church of the Lord? Am I a spiritual leader in my community? And this morning we'll expand this question a little further and ask this question. Am I creating spiritual leaders in my home and in my family? Are we developing spiritual leaders in our church? And are we creating spiritual leaders to be launched into our communities to make a difference in the kingdom of God? Leaders, spiritual leaders, don't just create people who follow them. They create more leaders who will then bring more people into the kingdom of God. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to open up, we're going to turn and go back a little bit, rewind to Numbers chapter 27. And this is going to detail a little bit of this transition between Moses and Joshua. And we're going to look at some of the strategy that they've taken. So the Harvard Business Review says this, that the average cost for a consultant to come into your company and set up some sort of leadership succession development plan. So some sort of plan to develop new leaders within your system so that when your CEO or your top executive leaves, that someone will be able to come in and fill this without any gap in leadership. The average price for that is $150,000. $150,000 just for someone to come in and offer you strategy and how to develop new leaders within your organization. But the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God gives us a pretty basic strategy for what it looks like to create more leaders and to disciple more workers, more leaders for the kingdom work of God. And so we'll take a look at the strategy that we see, this transition of power between Moses and Joshua, and we'll also look at the way that Jesus trains and develops and brings up his selected 12 apostles. But we'll begin just looking uh, in Numbers chapter 27. So the first thing we're going to see, and we'll, we'll have three points, and we'll, I want to ask you three questions this morning. And basically, these questions are hopefully in an effort to illuminate something in us where we can see some areas that we can improve in bringing up and building and developing more leaders in our homes and in our churches. So the first thing we're going to look at is this. Leaders recognize need, and they identify leaders. Leaders recognize a need. Leaders recognize a gap like we'll see Moses doing, recognizing that, hey, someone is going to need to stand in the gap here. Someone is going to need to have the baton passed on to them. And then they identify, they point out, and they say, you, you are qualified. You are going to do this. So leaders recognize and they identify. We'll start in Numbers chapter 27, verse 15. Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, Appoint someone over this community to go out and to come in before them. One who will lead them out and bring them in. So the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom there is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hands on him. So the very first thing that we recognize is this. Moses has this ability to look a little bit into the future, to not just look at his present situation and see the way that he is leading, but to understand that his leadership depends on how well he sets up Israel for success once he's gone. And so Moses is able to look in, and and I love the language that you see here. There's a lot of shepherding language there, isn't there? The going out, the coming in, all of that stuff, that's all sheep going out and coming into a pen. And he even uses the same language that we see Jesus using in Matthew chapter 9 when he says, Lord, I don't want your people, I don't want Israel to be like sheep without a shepherd, wandering aimlessly, lost, no one to care for them, no one to protect them. And so Moses asked this question, God, appoint someone over this community. Moses sees, Moses recognizes that there is a need, that one day I will be gone, one day soon I will be gone. And God, you need to appoint a leader, you need to appoint a shepherd over your people so they can be cared for, 
So they can be led in the direction and in the ways that you would have them go. And so Moses sees and he recognizes this need. So the first thing that we see him doing is just being able to have the, the foresight to know someone is going to need to take over. And the next thing we see him doing is asking God to provide a leader. Appoint someone over this community. So a very simple transaction is taking place between Moses and God. All it is is this. Moses has the leadership ability enough to say, someone's going to need to have the baton passed on to them. God, will you do it? Will you appoint someone? Will you give us a leader? Will you send someone our way and then watch what God does? God says, okay, you've asked and you're going to receive it. Go and find Joshua, a son of Nun, because that is a man in whom the spirit of leadership lies. That's a man who's demonstrated some leadership ability already so far. And so Moses recognizes the need, and he asks God to provide someone to lead the people, and God responds. Immediately in Scripture, we see it. God responds to this request that Moses has presented before him. So the question that, right off the bat, we have to ask ourselves is this. As spiritual leaders, are we praying for new leaders to step up? As spiritual leaders in our home, are we praying over our children And asking God to rise up in them, strong, bold, courageous leaders. That that language there, as God points to Joshua and says, in him is the spirit of leadership. The, The Hebrew just says, in him is the spirit. And that word spirit can also sort of be used in the same way that courage would be used. And so are we praying that our children will grow up to be courageous enough to be leaders in the kingdom of God? Are we praying for leaders to rise up? When we think about our church, are we praying that God will rise up men in this church who will lead strongly and boldly and courageously into the next generation? As we think about our communities, are we praying that God would rise up leaders for our communities who are strong and bold and courageous? One of the greatest things that Moses does is simply ask God, God, will you provide a leader for your people? You provide a shepherd for your sheep. And when Moses faithfully asks, God faithfully responds. So that's the, sort of the, the beginning model that we see. And now we're just going to flip. We're going to jump back and forth. But I want you to flip over to Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, we see Jesus uh, doing something, sort of calling forth his disciples. And so while we see that Moses is asking for this transition of power to go on to Joshua, what we know about Jesus, although he's not very upfront about it at first, but what we can see is that Jesus, later on in his life, you read through that, that last table scene in John, we know that Jesus has the foresight enough to know that his time is very, very brief here on this earth. And so Jesus is going to be very, very intentional about the way that he develops these men, these 12 men who are going to take his ministry, who are going to take the work of his father and run with it once he's gone. Jesus understands more than anybody that the true test of a leader is what happens after that leader is gone. Jesus knows his time is up, and so he is very intentional about pouring in to these disciples. This is in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside, And he called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. It continues, and it names off the 12 that Jesus appointed. But it's a very brief passage right there, but what's in this is so, so very important. Here's what Jesus is doing. Jesus has a sea of people who are following him. If you read the text leading up to this, what you see is that the crowds are starting to form around Jesus. And the work that Jesus has to do in his ministry is getting greater and greater and greater. And the end of Jesus' ministry is getting closer and closer and closer. And so Jesus recognizes a need to set up strong, quality leaders who will be able to shepherd his sheep once he is gone. And so Jesus calls out these 12 selected men. And their qualifications are all over the place, right? Right? You have tax collectors, you have fishermen. There seems to be no real qualification other than an eagerness to follow Jesus. And he calls them out by name. And the 12 of them come to him and he pulls them aside. And what we'll see is that Jesus is going to commission them. Jesus is going to basically say, listen, I'm going to pour into you and invest in you for the next couple of years. But what they don't know at this point is that that's because the power is going to soon be transferred over to them. They're going to have responsibility placed on their shoulders. But the first thing I want us to notice is this. Jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him. Their number one job 
right off the bat as leaders in training is to simply be with Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to listen from Jesus, to watch and observe the way that he handles situations, to watch and observe the way that he deals with people, to listen to the words as he talks about the kingdom that is near. Jesus is very intentionally naming leaders that he will teach, train, and invest in for the duration of his ministry and for his ministry after he is gone. That that word intentionally, we use that a lot, but basically this is just a way to say, this is no accident that Jesus does this. Jesus is very purposeful in the way that he is selecting these 12 and pouring into and investing in them. So the first question that we ask is this. As we're thinking about recognizing the need for leaders to rise up in our families, in our church, in our communities, recognizing that need and asking God to send those leaders, but also there's some power in identifying leadership in people and having someone point to you like Jesus does and says, you, I want you to be a leader for this flock. So the first question we ask is this. Who am I intentionally investing in as a leader and as a disciple? Am I pouring into anyone? Am I discipling anybody? Am I teaching anybody about Jesus? Am I developing leadership in any younger person? Am I developing leadership in any new Christians? Who am I intentionally pouring into and investing into as a leader and as a disciple? There is so much power in someone saying, I see leadership in you. When I was in eighth grade, I I did this little sermon at this thing that Lipscomb had, uh, and there was probably like 15 people in attendance there. And I preached for about five minutes. Can you imagine that I preached that short? Uh, Just five minutes. And so I preached for about five minutes, and it probably was just nothing spectacular. Uh, But at the very end of that sermon, there was a man, and and I don't know him, but I still have this letter. Uh, It's at my parents' house in a book. But he comes, and he had written out this stuff after I spoke, uh, basically saying, I see something in you. I see something in you that I believe the Lord will use if you will allow him to. And he pointed out that there was some leadership in this 14-year-old who was trying to talk about prayer and read from the Bible and make some sense of it. And I will never forget the feeling that that gave me. That man might as well have balled that note up and stuck it on my heart because it stayed there ever since. There's so much power in someone pointing to you and identifying in you that I see leadership in you. And the church or this family, or this community needs the spiritual leadership that you are capable of? Do we recognize the need for spiritual leaders to rise up? And are we identifying the spiritual leadership that we see in those around us? So the next thing, new leaders, these new leaders that we're hoping to develop and rise up, they need experience to learn, and they need opportunity in order to grow. Experience to learn and opportunity to grow. When I was in high school, we had an exchange student who came over from Italy all the way to Newmarket. Uh, What a culture shock that must have been for this guy. So from Italy to Newmarket, this guy comes, and he was a great guy. We loved him, and he hung out with a lot of us. And he asked this question as spring football rolled around. He said, I want to play football. And so after we spent some time clarifying, okay, are you sure you're thinking about the right thing? This isn't soccer, this is football. And we showed him, he said, oh, yeah, 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 I understand. And I won't do an Italian accent because David Ezel will get offended at me. Uh, David speaks very fluent Italian, but he said, no, 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 I I want to play real football. And so we asked, have you ever played before? And he says, well, no, but I'm, I'm familiar with the game. I said, okay, you're familiar with the game. And then he proceeds to explain to us that he's played a lot of American football video games. And so he knows the rules, and he knows how the games work. And so we tried to tell him, look, there is a really, really big difference between just being familiar with the game and playing the game. But he goes out, and he puts his helmet on, and uh, what happened to that guy that first day of practice should be illegal. Uh, Because he took a lot of hits from a lot of guys who had been playing football since they were in fourth grade and were offended that this guy thought he knew how to play just because he had played some video games. But that day, that afternoon at practice, he understood something, and that's this. That understanding the game is a lot different than taking a hit. Sometimes, as spiritual leaders, this life of discipleship is much the same. We can read about it, and we can learn about it, and we can listen to sermons on leadership, and we can listen to sermons on discipleship, but until we're actively doing some of these things, until we've experienced some real-life experiences and some lumps and some bruises, it's just really hard to understand what it looks like 
on a daily basis to be a spiritual leader and a disciple of Jesus. Henry Mitzberg says this, leadership is like swimming. You can't learn just by reading about it. Can you imagine that, thinking about trying to learn how to swim by just reading about it? No, we need experience. We need thrown into the pool. And God understands this as he display or he lays out these instructions for Moses. And Jesus understands it as he sets his disciples and his apostles up for ministry after he is gone. Flip back over to uh, Numbers. Numbers 27. So it continues here in verse 19. Have him, this is Joshua, stand before Eleazar, the priest, and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority, so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar, the priest, who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. And at his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. And so here's what God is doing. Here's what God is telling Moses. He says, okay, listen, I've identified the leader. You're gonna go to Joshua and you're gonna ask him, you're gonna lay your hand on him, have him rise up as a leader. But there's also gonna be a task for you, Moses, and that's this, to give him some of your authority. Give him some of your authority. And for Moses, he's carrying, uh, second to God, all of the authority here in Israel. And what God's asking him to do is to give him a little bit of the share of the burden of authority. Place a little bit on Joshua's plate, Moses. And I think it's obviously for the benefit of Israel so that they can see Joshua and in a position of leadership so they can see Joshua leading and God understands that, that the people need to see a leader in Joshua. And so he tells Moses, listen, give him some authority. Publicly pass on some of this authority so that the people can see him as a leader. But I think a little bit, this is also for Joshua so that he can ride with the training wheels on for a little bit. To not take the full burden and the full load of authority, but to take a little bit of it. As Moses is still serving the people faithfully, Joshua is going to come in and not serve here as a studier or as an observer. Observer, God doesn't say, okay, just have Joshua watch you really, really closely. Or, or Moses, write down all of the ways that you lead and give that to Joshua so that he'll know. No, God is setting up Joshua as somewhat of a leadership apprentice. Get your hands dirty. Let him get his hands dirty a little bit. The next thing that he talks about is having him stand before Eleazar the priest and having him receive decisions from the Lord, inquiring from the Urim. That's a, that's a weird thing, but basically this Urim is like some sort of breastplate that the priest would wear. And this is a way that some sort of thing that they would use to inquire um, messages and, and word from God. That's a way that the priest received some word from God. And it was one of Moses' duties to receive word from God through the priest and then relay it onto the people. And so essentially what God is telling Moses to do is not only share some of his authority, but to share some of his responsibilities. Give him a job to do. Give him work to do. Let him be active in learning how to lead. And so not only is there work and not only is there a task in understanding that we need leaders and understanding and identifying who these leaders are, but we also have a duty to be able to set them up and to give them responsibility so they can gain experience. Give them opportunities to lead. We'll continue on. We'll go back to, uh, to Mark chapter three, or I think I said chapter six. Mark chapter three. Jesus goes up on a mountainside as we just read. He called to them those he wanted to come. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. So that's the first part of Jesus' sort of discipleship model. Be with me. Learn from me. Observe the things that I do. Soak it all in as I'm pouring into you. But then the second part is this. Jesus doesn't just call them to be people who are soaking up the things that he's doing. Jesus calls his disciples to be people who are doing the things that he's doing. He says that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Jesus isn't just calling these guys to be people who are watching. Jesus is calling these disciples to be people who are doing. Jesus gives them authority. Jesus gives them responsibility. He gives them a job. He's going to send them out to preach. If you look at Mark chapter 6, what you'll see is that the task that they've been given is difficult. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 6, then Jesus went out around teaching from village to village. Calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits with these instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place. Shake the dust off of your feet as a, temporary, as a testimony against them. Then they went out, 
and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, and they anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Jesus is calling these leaders, these young leaders, to himself, and he's rising up in them. He is developing in them men who are going to be able to carry out this ministry once he has ascended back up into heaven after his resurrection. Jesus gives them authority through the Spirit of God. Jesus gives them a responsibility as he's given them this task to preach that the kingdom of God is near and to heal sick people, to do the work that he has been doing. Jesus is developing and training through experience and opportunity with his disciples. So the second question we ask is this. How am I intentionally passing on responsibility to new leaders and disciples? Are we giving new spiritual leaders an opportunity to spread their wings, or are we keeping them under our wings? You see, we can't be surprised one day if our children grow up and they don't become spiritual leaders as husbands, as wives, or as parents, or as they grow up and they accept some position as a boss, if we haven't given them the opportunity, we can't expect be surprised if they're not spiritual leaders, if we haven't given them the opportunity to be spiritual leaders before they get to those points. We have to be developing and training young spiritual leaders. Now, give them an opportunity. Give them responsibility. Ask them to do things. There was that man I told you about who placed that, that thing on my heart and said, I see in you some leadership. There was also another man, Dr. Bradley at Mayfair, who also saw the same thing. And he didn't just identify it in me, but he did something that would drive me absolutely nuts when I was a student, is he would come to me and he would say, you, you're leading communion this Sunday. And I would say, I don't know about that, I don't know about that. And he would say, it wasn't a question. You're going to lead communion this Sunday. Or you're going to preach Sunday night. And I would say, oh, I don't want to do that. But there wasn't a question. Dr. Bradley gave me responsibility. Dr. Bradley gave me opportunity to stand up and sometimes make a fool of myself. Because he understood that there was power in leading the next generation to be the spiritual leaders that the kingdom of God needs. The last thing, very shortly, is this. New leaders need to be lifted up and they need to be launched out. They need to be lifted up and they need to be released so they can do the work that God has prepared for them to do. Numbers 27 continues, Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and he had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and he commissioned him. This is a public act that Moses is doing. This is a way for Moses to say, this is your new leader, follow him. And then he commissions and he sends Joshua out to do the work that God is calling him to do as the Lord instructed through Moses. This is sort of that pushing baby bird out of the nest moment. Because if all we do is train, then we're wasting our time. We have to be lifting up, rising up new leaders so that we can launch them out and allow them to participate in the mission of God, allow them to lead in the kingdom of God. Take a look at what Jesus does. This is after Jesus' death on the cross, after his resurrection. And I feel like we read this almost every other week. And as I was typing out this slide, I thought, have we talked about this verse enough? And then I thought, how crazy that is. Because there might not be a more purposeful or mission, better mission statement for us as disciples of Jesus as this. We should read it every single week. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus isn't just developing 12 men because he needs something to do in these three-year ministry that he's got. Jesus isn't just developing these guys just in case. Jesus is developing them so that when he ascends to go back to the Father, he can send them out over all of the world, and the message of God, and the message of God's love, and his grace, and his mercy can be propelled to the very ends of the earth. There's a job for these men to do. There's sheep for them to shepherd. There's people for them to lead spiritually. Jesus has been developing Jesus has been training them for a purpose. And eventually, we have to release our spiritual leaders in our home, in our church, in our community to start being active and start taking responsibility to lead well and to lead faithfully. Last question we have is this. How am I intentionally equipping and sending new leaders and disciples? See, it's so important what Jesus says there in Matthew 28. He says, make more disciples. 
Make more disciples. Make more leaders. That's your job as a disciple is to find someone else to disciple who will disciple someone else. This is how the kingdom of God, this is how the message of God, this is how the gospel is spread into the hearts of people all over, all over the world. Because if we don't do this, if we don't create more disciples, if we don't rise up more leaders, then the message of the grace of God will die. There's a generation of people who will come after us who need to know about the Lord. It is up to us to create spiritual leaders who will bring it to them. Remember the passage in Judges chapter two. It says, after that, the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, and another generation grew up who? For Joshua's case, it was another generation grew up who didn't know the Lord or the things the Lord had done. You and I are faced with another version of this passage today, and it's just left blank right here. To be decided, after we pass away, after our time as spiritual leadership, after our time as spiritual leaders is up, there will be another generation after us, our children, and our children's children, and their children, who, what? Who know the Lord, who love the Lord, or who never had anyone to show it to them. It's our job as spiritual leaders to be people who are creating, who are praying for, new spiritual leaders to rise up, who are giving them experience and opportunity, opportunity to get their lumps and bruises, to learn how to lead faithfully and to learn how to lead well. The kingdom of God and the work of God is depending on us to lead well. May we faithfully do so. This morning, if there's anyone in here who would like to say, I'm ready to be a follower, but a follower who will make more leaders, I'm ready to follow Jesus Christ. And we ask that you do so and come forward as we stand together and as we sing.